forced to speak in the country of my birth is a big deal for me, to be honest. Because this is where all my ideas around syncretity and secularism and love have been shaped. And to share that with you guys um, in Mumbai is a, is a big privilege. So I'm actually very excited to be here. Now, this India, you know, amazing, amazing civilization. This is a country with glorious manifestations of love. You know, where we are taught to love our parents, our mother, our gods and goddesses, our sisters and brothers. And in, in fact, where romantic and erotic love are enshrined in texts and in temples that are thousands of years old. So this is a very special place to be actually talking about love. The sad thing, though, is we live in a time where hate dominates the world, but not love. Now, in America, we have a president whose entire campaign was built on misogyny, homophobia, xenophobia, racism, intolerance. And right here in India, by the way, hateful acts happen every day. We rape our women and our children even. We torment our minorities and put the poor through incredible hardship. And elsewhere also, we read stories of violence and intolerance, suffering and chaos. That's the world. That's the world today. Even, you know, the dispossessed have not been spared our vitriol. Does anyone not know about the Syrian refugee crisis? Anyone? We all know about that. It's affected, it's one of the biggest humanitarian tragedies of our time, and it's affected 13 and a half million people around the world. There's five million new refugees in the world because of it. Now, these innocent human beings are fleeing dictators and fanatics in a war which, in which they've seen their parents get blown up and their children crushed under tanks. They deserve our, our, you know, our most compassionate selves. They deserve our kindness. But yet, I mean, many countries have treated them very shamefully. They've been raped. They've been denied entry. They've been shot at. They've been interned. They've been mislabeled terrorists. And they've been exploited by politicians. What is the, one of the first few things that Trump did was actually ban Syrians if he went and hung out with some of these Syrians, as I did in Lebanon, I think he might, you know, I, I think he might view the whole thing very differently. And he might learn just not that the fact that they're innocent and harmless, but they're so perseverant and beautiful and graceful in what they're going through, I think he might change his mind. But yet, I'm not here to, to talk about that. You know, the problem is that hate is dominating this world, right? So the question you have to ask yourself is, what about love? Love actually is the theme in more than half the content that is created in the world, whether it's film or television. And there's, I think, hardly a Bollywood film or a song that doesn't have some reference to love. And yet, most of this content is riddled with cliches, devoid of humanity, and leaves one hungry for alternative endings unexamined themes, and empathy for those who are not like us. Rarely do we see stories that cut to the heart of the matter, the turbulent, inexplicable, bleeding, broken, unpredictable, derelict, joyous, all-encompassing, blind, and foolish heart of love in all its multicolored glory. In my own career at MTV, I've tried to tell the untold story the alternative narrative that goes beyond regurgitation and feel-good endings. You know, we like to tie up stories neatly. Gay love stories in America usually end very badly. I don't know why. I don't know why that is. And I've handed the microphone to those whose voices have not been heard. And today, I'd like to present some of those stories of love in four different categories. The first is TV, television. Now, in 2014, and actually throughout my career, I've spent a lot of time examining and researching young people and their attitudes and feelings on many aspects of pop culture and their emotional and romantic lives. And I'm continually surprised at what I learned. What I found is that most of these 18 to 29-year-olds felt that depictions of, depictions of their relationships in media were shallow, one-dimensional, and gamified. They felt that portrayals of their relationships were stripped of innocence and beauty. And they gave examples of shows like The Bachelor. Many also said that media neglected and stereotyped unconventional love, such as gay, bisexual, biracial, or young with old. 
They also said that social media had actually profoundly magnified the power of love to create connections between people in faraway places, a fact that seems to be lost on storytellers. Now, there are visionary shows, Transparent, Orange is the New Black. There are shows that are actually widening the aperture of love. But we are still in the dark ages in America and very far off in India where authentic and inclusive depictions of love are concerned. So with that background and with that insight, we created a multi-platform series called We Are Lovers. This series fe actually features young people in real relationships. And you know the idea there was to tell their stories in a cinematic but unfiltered manner, portraying the diversity, the heartache, and redemptive power of love, and how it manifests itself in different cities of the world. The format itself, by the way, is a new format. It's part fantasy part reality and partly scripted in that we've allowed the people, the characters in the episodes to actually shape their own story and we kind of step out of the way. But here's what's interesting. This is also possibly the first transmedia or maybe one of the first few transmedia series. It's truly a, an experience that extends beyond TV. So we have the classic 30 minute episode, the TV episode of it, but all of the characters actually maintain their own, they, they keep maintaining their, their love story, they keep telling us about their relationship on social, on digital, on Tumblr and Instagram. So once the episode is over, you can actually follow what happens to X and Y in their relationship, and then we cull season two from storylines that emerge on social media. Not only that, the fantasy portion. So when we were filming this, we asked uh, the couples, and sometimes they were threesomes, or even foursomes, we asked them to articulate a fantasy that we would film separately as a short film. And then we would eventually un um, intercut it into the episode. So those fantasies that we've shot, they're not all sexual, by the way. A, fa a fantasy is, for example, a girl wanted to have, her fantasy is to have this big, lavish, romantic church wedding. So we've shot that, for example, in 360. It's, and you can actually download an app and be inside somebody's fantasy. Um, so I didn't bring that to show you because I thought it might become too cumbersome for an hour-long class, but um, the series works across many different platforms. So moving on to a different category, fashion. All of us are touched by fashion. We all indulge in it, whether we like it or not. The fashion industry is omnipresent and also one of the most one-dimensional, superficial, and exclusive. It's created incredibly unhealthy, stand, unhealthy and narrow standards of beauty. Not everyone can be a thin white girl. I cannot be a thin white girl. And if we're not, often we feel excluded. If we're, if we're plus size, we're excluded. If we're, if we're black or brown, we feel excluded. And even though brands like Diesel are changing things, that, uh, there are still brands like Balenciaga, for example, and Vitamins, whose policy seems to be only white. Um, not, only, not only that, but high fashion shows little empathy for people of color. And anyone who cannot afford to buy those $1,000 pair, pair of shoes seems to be you know, excluded somehow. And if you look at fashion video content, most of it is vacuous and antiseptic. Thin, pale, and otherworldly people populating an alternative reality. So I created a series called Forward that features change agents, young and old, of all shapes and sizes, that are creating big differences, radical differences, and revolutionizing the industry. Each episode is in three sections. There's a profile of somebody, it might be a model or a cinematographer or a designer, um, who's changing things, who's blowing this shit up. The second uh, segment is an original music video, again, featuring progressive musicians and you know, creating original content with them, integrating brands as well who are aligned to the new vision. And then the third segment is an original film that's a collaboration between a director and a brand, and it's an original standalone piece of story. By the way, there's, there are other people, some in India, that are doing incredibly powerful work in fashion, and you should check out their work. Bharat Sikka is one of them, and he created this wonderful film called Holy Holy. Um, you should check that out. Let's talk about love in cinema. This is one of the centers of cinema in the world. Uh, in 2015, I actually saw dozens of love films about love. 
And I came to the conclusion that there were many themes not explored and certain types of love simply not legitimized and poeticized because those kinds of stories are simply not accepted in the, that particular culture. So we reached out to some of the leading international directors to make short films about love they thought should be seen but haven't been made. And we gave them actually complete creative freedom and you know, they could do anything they wanted as long as we had agreed on the script in advance. So the result of that was Madly. Madly is an omnibus feature made of six short films from some of the world's most talented directors. And the film has actually provoked conversations about the transformative nature of love in the many cities it's been screened. So, you know, making this film was really humbling for me. Why? Because I made, a, you know, I was hallucinating and I made a list of 50 directors I thought I loved who might be able to do really good work for me for this project. And I didn't expect a single one of them to respond. I mean, why should they make a stupid film, a short film for Nusrat Durrani of all people? For example, I approached Anurag Kashyap um, in India and Sion Sono, who is one of the cult directors of Japan, and Mia Basikowska, who is uh, probably one of the top 10 Hollywood actresses now, um, and Sebastian Silva, who, won, who has won Sundance Best Director. I was shocked, honestly, to see the number of people, a very, very high percentage of directors responded because they said unanimously that they simply are not allowed to, because of many circumstances, allowed to make the films they should be making. And that was incredibly inspiring to me. So, you know, we have stories in this, in this film about a young woman in England, for example, in love with the ghost of her father. And she cannot resolve this before she gets married to the person she actually loves. We've got a young mother's delicate, tender, uh, tentative love for a child that she didn't want, who is in her life now. Uh, two young black men in New York City and how they reconcile the opposition of their parents to that, to that affair or that relationship. And Sion Sano's story from Japan is the wildest of them all. There's a very conservative Japanese family uh, that has two daughters and they both are frequenting sex clubs uh, and having a great time. And how that, that experience actually transforms the love, erotic and, and emotional, between this middle-aged Japanese couple. So there are kinds of stories that really aren't told. Catch madly when it comes to your town. You know, I screened the film for the very first time at the Mumbai Film Festival in October, and truly I was uh, apprehensive because I didn't know what the, how the Indian audience would receive it, and uh, I thought maybe I'll never be allowed to come back to India or something. Uh, it was terrifying, and I went to, to the screening uh, with some of my friends who are here today, actually, and I was surprised to see what the reception it received. It was unanimous, unanimously applauded, and we, were, we had a Q&A for 15 minutes, which went into 45 minutes. And the beautiful thing was not only did the audience love Clean Shaven, but they had questions and appreciation for all the films in this omnibus, so I'm very inspired by that. Obviously, Indian audiences are much smarter and more nuanced and sensitive than we give them credit for. So I hope that there'll be more films made like this. But with that, you know, I'm going to move to um, a category that we don't usually associate um, with love, you know, and that is the love of country. So when I moved to America more than 20 years ago to work for MTV, I was shocked to realize how little Americans actually knew about the rest of the world. One of the things I was often, you know, in conversation told was that Indira Gandhi is the daughter of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, not only that, you know, I went to the US from Dubai. And a lot of people thought at the time, 20 years ago, before Dubai began its PR strategy, uh, people thought Dubai was in India. Now, obviously not everyone in the country is um, so ill-informed, but you know, the fact is that they have a one-dimensional, we have uh, a one-dimensional understanding of other countries, and it's based upon politicized news headlines and talking heads on TV. And, uh, Media tends to paint entire countries and cultures with one brutal brush stroke. Examples are Iran is the axis of evil. Iran is one of the most, one of the oldest civilizations in the world. Afghanistan is synonymous with the Taliban, with misogyny, with bombs, with Karzai being crooked and our troops are there. That's the poetry we have, we know of Afghanistan. Israel and Palestine are always painted 
in the context of the hatred between those two countries. You know, what we forget is that flesh and blood people like all of us in this room exist there. And it's not just the talking heads and the mullahs in these countries, but also young people, people like us. I'm not young, but a lot, most of you are. But we rarely get to see what the youth in these troubled countries are doing, what are they about, what are their hopes and aspirations. Very little is known about them. And countries in conflict in particular have been stripped of all humanity, and we rarely hear from the youth there. So that was the context for this series that we created called Rebel Music. And it answers some of those questions that I'm ask asking. These are stories of youth in revolt. Some of them are civilians. Some of them are just musicians and activists. All of them are fighting injustice and oppression incredibly courageously. I've shot this in Tahrir Square during the second revolution in Egypt. I was in Taksim Square shooting this when that was going on. And we've shot in Mali, in Mexico, in Israel, in Palestine, Venezuela, in Senegal, and Myanmar. And we've seen a very, very different reality on the ground. And it's all about humanizing these countries by presenting a much broader perspective on what Iran is and what Turkey is and what Egypt is. And Rebel Music does that. It's the first time that I feel like young American audiences were actually exposed to the real thing in Iran or Turkey or, or Venezuela, wherever we were, we were. And so when you know, we were creating the series, the feedback initially from a lot of people was, no one's going to watch this. This is all sort of bullshit, boring documentary stuff about countries we're tired of hearing about, so forget it. And it was incredibly challenging for me to get this funded. But you know, to its credit, Viacom and MTV let me do it because I believed and our team believed so passionately in that this is a thing that needs to be made and it will be appreciated. And guess what? The Native America episode of Rebel Music from season two is the most viewed, shared, and commented upon piece of video content MTV ever put up on social media in its history. Um, so I'm particularly proud of this. Uh, not only that, you know, we decided that we would approach the distribution of this series differently. And that particular episode, Native America, you know, what we did with that was that we, when we discovered that most Indian reservations actually don't have cable television. Can you believe this? In the US, Many reservations don't have basic things, electricity, fresh grocery, and cable TV. So a lot of the youth actually go to internet cafes to watch video content and or access it through mobile. So we decided, because we wanted to show um, this story not just to in the, the US and the rest of the world, but also to those people whose stories these are. And so we decided for the very first time to premiere a long form piece of content on Facebook instead of doing the traditional thing, which is showing something on TV and having some sort of complementary uh, additive content on social and digital platforms. And we premiered that, and I was in, when the, when the, the episode uh, first premiered, I was in Copenhagen on a panel. I was jet lagged, and I didn't know what the hell's going, maybe I'd lose my job because we put so much effort into this. And I got a call, which my marketing head actually insisted I take on the panel itself. And she said, this has gone completely viral and it's blown up and we've done millions and millions of views within the first 48 hours. So it was incredibly um, redemptive that that happened. Not only that, I was invited to screen this episode and meet President Obama, who thanked, him, he thanked me for actually telling the true and authentic story of young Native Americans fighting for their culture and their tradition. How many people even know what young Native Americans look like? In America, very few people even knew. This is their, this was, the US was their country. And their stories were always you know, told in this really sort of negative, derogatory context. And initially, you know, when we approached the Native community, they refused to actually cooperate because they said, every time we let the media do something, they misrepresent us. It took a long time for me, actually 18 months, to make this one film because we had to gain their trust. And eventually, uh, it was the, the notion of empathy. And we let them tell the story they wanted to tell. And I think that's why this succeeded. It's been watched millions of times, not only by Native, by Native Americans, but also by people around the world. 
I encourage you to actually go to MTV's Facebook page and actually search this out and see the poetry of uh, commentary around this episode. So with that long preamble, can we play the trailer of Rebel Music? As indigenous people, we've been dehumanized so much, and this music is a powerful tool to express our humanity. So, you know, coming back to love and hate, you know, my friend, the writer and practicing Sufi, Sufi Sadia Delby, told me, you know, we were having a conversation about this talk, and she said, you know, Nusrat, love um, is really our natural state. It, hate is not sustainable. We're not really made to hate. Love is the sustainable emotion. So, and I kind of agree with her. But I think love is ultimately not about passion. I think love is about empathy and compassion. So in these troubled times, let's focus on creating strategies that foster empathy and compassion. Something I've tried to do in my own work, and uh, I think to go fully renegade about this, uh, I'd like to borrow an idea from writer Mandy Len Catron. And she argues that we create more lasting relationships and propagate love more efficiently by changing the way we talk about it. And I think it's a very interesting idea. So let's examine the poetry, the usual poetry of love. I mean, we all have encountered it in some shape or form. Let's look at that. The usual verbiage about love makes it sound devastating and horrible. We're falling in love as if we're falling into a manhole or an abandoned well. Um, we're crushed, uh, you know, our hearts are aching. Love is crazy, love is madness, we suffer in love. It sounds like a terrible thing in a condition that cannot be tolerated for more than a few weeks or months. And who would like to be in, in a state of madness forever? I mean, you know, would you like a lifetime of heartache? No, I don't think so. But if we, ch if we change the poetry about love, we might be able to achieve what we thought was impossible. And instead of thinking of love as a crushing emotion steeped in madness, we treat it as a collaborative work of art that requires effort, compromise, patience, and shared goals. So Mandy Lancatron proposes that instead of falling in love, like falling into this evil river, we, we step into it as a conscious, deliberate act. And I like this approach a lot because it can result in romantic love that lasts, but also allows us to create love-based solutions to hate-based problems. So let's examine what will happen if we step into love. Um, you know, we collaborate, we trust, we think uh, of the other, we are patient, we communicate. And I think we can do each do our bit by stepping into love with someone we don't agree with and becoming more tolerant of those different from us. None of the work you saw today would have been possible without that approach, by the way. Um, like any collaboration, this will be hard because we are thinking not just of our own needs, but also what we can offer the other. The Native America episode is a great example of that. As long as I had my own agenda, which I thought I'm going to make an amazing film about young Native Americans, uh, which wasn't a bad thing I was trying to do, but it was me trying to impose my will on those folks. And then we agreed to collaborate and you know, what we gave to them was a high quality storytelling mecha mechanism and an incredible platform. What they gave to us were their stories and their trust. I think like any collaboration, this is gonna be hard because we are thinking not just of our own needs, as I said, but also what we can offer other people. And if we change the poetry of love, we can all create artworks, I think. Artworks that are made of outrageous acts of kindness. I mean, let's try that. Let's be outrageously kind one day and see what happens stockpiles of generosity instead of arms and ammunitions, and endless openness. So I propose that in our personal and professional lives, let's proactively look for situ situations where we can step into love with someone as if we're negotiating a deal, as if we're creating art together. And I'll give you a personal thing in my personal story that when I went to America, I was very timid and shy and reserved and introvert. And I realized very quickly in the media industry that simply doesn't work. And I had to spend a long time reimagining my own self and creating a new persona that was assertive and gregarious and more open, and I would slip it on. It took me a long time. I took speaking um, lessons, I took uh, presentation classes, I took speech lessons. I practiced in front of the mirror, I remember. And I wanted to be this assertive person who can navigate the harsh and competitive environment I found myself in. 
and honestly, it worked. It's not that the shy introvert is, t is not there anymore. It still is. But I can slip on, I can take on a new persona when I have to navigate the world of business and the world of New York City. And so I just, I think that, I suggest and I propose to you that all of you also develop a new persona, which is an avatar of love. And you slip that persona on, you know, when, when you need to. You slip it on uh, when you know that you're going to create an artwork of empathy with someone. I think we can all become soldiers of love. To track down the other we have for so long hated or misunderstood and create an artwork of love with them. And in closing, I'd like to say that all of us have the power to change the world. Literally every single one of us. We don't have to be diplomats or, um, you know, bureaucrats or doctors or whatever. We can all, we all have what it takes to reverse the tide of hatred by being more empathetic and seeing the humanity in other people. And we can change the world by being more tolerant of those that are different from us. And we can all use the power of love we have within us to heal this world. Thank you so much. So tell us about that story of you walking into the MTV office in the rain as a 35 year old, um, because how you reached MTV itself is quite a story. So that's a very share that with us. story. And I, I don't know, maybe I'll slip into my, this other persona and actually tell it. So, you know, my story with MTV was also actually a story of love. It was a love story. And it was a one-sided, unrequited love story because I saw Dubai a long, um, in 1992, uh, for the first time in Dubai when I was working there, I was switched on the channel and Let's Dance was playing the David Bowie video of it. And I decided, I watched MTV all night long and decided that this is my calling. This is what I have to do because I grew up on rock and roll. And, um, you know, I did some research. You know, I went to the USIS office and I asked them, what the hell is this MTV thing? And they were like, what, MTV is a channel. I said, I, can, can you give me some information about it? And they didn't have anything. So they said, well, we don't, but we'll dig it up. And I came back disappointed. I went back and I'm like, what do I do? How do I get this MTV thing, you know? About two weeks later, I received a box uh, from the USIS office, a large cardboard box, which believe it or not, the USIS works, man. They had sent me photocopies, cyclostyle stuff, fax stuff, all the things you needed about, they, they actually photocopied an entire book called MTV, The Making of a Revolution, and I was delighted. I read all of it and took two weeks off work and got on a plane to New York City thinking, man, this is it, um, you know, I might as well just quit and go. And um, I landed up uh, in the MTV headquarters, in those days you could actually go up in Times Square and meet, and they're like, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for a job so confident, you know? And they said, okay, go to the 16th floor and meet the HR folks. And I went and I met this wonderful lady and she was like, yeah, cool, you know? Um, Dubai from India, yeah, it's a great city, I've heard. I said, well, <laughs> a little different. What do you do? Uh, like, I work for Honda, things like that. Anyway, she was very nice, but bottom line is she's like, you know, we just don't hire people off the streets, Nusrat. You know, thank you for coming. Be in touch. I'll send you a T-shirt. Like, what are you talking about? My, you know, my wife's standing downstairs. I need to get a job with you. So, of course, I didn't get hired, and I went uh, back to Dubai with my tail between my legs. So disillusioned and depressed, you know. It was terrible. But we wanted, I wanted it so bad. I actually quit my job, and I, I don't recommend this to anybody who's listening, <laughs> thinking this is such an inspiring story. It's not. It's a terrifying story. I quit my job and I went back to New York and holed up there in the worst winter New York had seen for the past 50 years at that time. And I went back to MTV and I said, you've got to hire me because I quit my job. And I met the same lady and she's like, what's the matter with you? Are you kidding? There's no way we can hire you. And you know, she's again, she was wonderful. But of course she didn't hire me. And I just stayed, I had nowhere to go. I mean, I had, there was no net, there was no plan B. This was the plan A, B, and C. And I kept at it. Of course, I applied for internships elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera, and other things. But one day, summer, six months later, she called me and she said, I have a proposal. I said, what's that? She said, we have a great internship program. 
So I said, okay, that's good. I mean, I'm not looking for an internship. I'm looking to work for you. She's like, Nusrat, I'm trying to do you a favor. Two and a half thousand people apply for these 20 positions. Just a thought, you know, think it over. And obviously it was the worst and most har hardest decision I'd ever have to take. But I took that f***ing internship. I was 35 years old. I was the oldest intern at MTV, photocopying stuff and faxing stuff with undergrad students and serving coffee and doing all sorts of crazy shit. But I do think in hindsight it was a, the best decision I actually took because once that internship was over, I got hired. Uh, so that's my silly story. And since then, there's been no, no looking back. It's been the most incredible job that anyone could have thought of for me, who I am, I'm, you know, I live for music and for pop culture, so. But I have been thinking about a lot of these issues like empathy, love, and, you know, given even the Syrian refugee crisis that I looked at Germany last year, and there was this image of a woman on the Frankfurt station, a Syrian woman, and that just doesn't leave my mind. So as an artist, uh, what would you say? I mean, what is one of the ways that we could propagate this empathy to others? Well, you have to fling yourself headlong into the world that you read about, you know? Um, speaking of the Syrian refugee crisis, um, I took a sabbatical um, and I had been hearing about this so much myself. And I actually got on a plane and I went to Lebanon where I knew somebody had started a small NGO called Salam LADC. And again, I was laughed at because they, people said, why don't you write a check if you're so interested in this? And I had been writing checks, but I went. And I was told it's dangerous, and it was dangerous. And I went five miles from the Syrian border, and I actually went into the Syrian refugee camps. Truly, I have to tell you, it was the most empowering and, pr and most transformative experience of my entire life, the time I spent in those refugee camps, for two reasons, by the way. One is actually seeing firsthand what is happening. Who are these people that are being demonized in the West? Not everybody, by everybody, but by major, major people. The President of the United States is banning refugees from entering America. It's the most horrendous and laughable thing. Laughable, because it's idiotic. If he met any of these, any one of these people, he would be different. So I went there, experienced the grace and the perseverance with which these people are dealing with what's happened to them. But the other thing I experienced was the, the, the volunteer community itself. Now there were 18 people that I was with. We were sharing a ramshackle warehouse. And it was completely sort of like devoid of any luxury. There were people from Norway, Sweden, England, Pakistan, you know, Lebanon, Students, young, old, people who are engineers, lawyers, had just given up everything to go work as volunteers. And their devotion and their selflessness and their compassion was to me equally transformative. Because we talk so much about refugees being refused entry, drowning, you know, getting raped and interned. We don't actually talk about the people who are doing the opposite. You know, I, we used to get up at five in the morning there was no breakfast or coffee or beds even and go start hauling supplies into trucks and delivering them by hand and you know organizing medicine and livestock and shoes and I think we all of us I mean not everyone has to fly to a dangerous place where ISIS and you know all kinds of crazy people are but we all don't have to go to refugee camps we can do this our, in our own environment in small and humbler ways you know Let's see what the rest of this world is about that we read about. So again, it's a long-winded answer to a really wonderful question, but I do encourage you to touch the world that you so often hear about in such negative ways. Dive into it. It's not going to kill you. In this world of, of trying to change the way people see love and, and have a different lens on things and expose them, on the other side, you have this chase for likes and hearts and and follow me and followers and everything else on the social media side. Do you think those things end up working across purposes? Are you, are you chasing a, you have a bunch of people chasing a fantastical world in, in an online social media environment, and then you have this real world going on here and reconciling these things. H how do you see that stuff playing out over time? I mean, it's chaotic and unpredictable and completely, uh, you know, 
uh, without any calibration. I don't know if there's a resolution or not. I do know that the world of social media and digital technology has enabled both incredible good and incredible ugliness, like the real world. And my, my personal experience is, and my, even my professional experience, that I think you have to apply the same decorum, the same humanity, the same sensitivity that you do in the real world um, online and on social media. And I think there's a balance. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but I think there's a balance. I mean, look at this good social media has done. Even in this case, this example of Syrian refugees, this small team is mobilizing hundreds of thousands of dollars to s literally save hundreds of lives. And they're not heard of. They're using their cell phones. They're using their Facebook pages. They're using all, any method they can get on. You know, from wiring money, money in, uh, through whatever the Western Union, to calling somebody and saying, hey, send me a bank, bank transfer, to all sorts of apps and social media devices. So I don't know if that's the answer to your question, but it's chaotic. It's just like real life is, there's no, I mean, there's no magic answer to it. I think you have to imagine yourself and your pre presence and your persona and your ideology on social media They're just in the same way that you had to in the real world. This is my humble take on it. Hi. Uh I'm Prakriti, I'm a journalism student. Too often in our internships, when we come up with a positive story, the boss, the editor is like, this is not a headline, or this is something we can't publish, just put it on your Facebook page or Instagram or something. So how do we break that mold of you know, making them see that there are real stories that are positive and happy, and it is news? Uh, what a great question, by the way. Because this is a dilemma every day for us. You know, often the truth doesn't sell. But guess what happens when you start doing exactly what, you know, your boss wants you to do? You have Donald Trump as president of the United States. That's what happens. <laughs> this, this phenomenon that's happened is a direct result of this kind of media strategy. What is Donald Trump? Trump? He is a star of reality TV. We had this coming to us. We have Kim Kardashian as the biggest superstar in America. And we now have a president that has mined this kind of tasteless bullshit that we feature on, on mainstream media. That's what happens. What you should do, I cannot say it's so personal, but I would walk right out the door and do what needs to really be done. Because otherwise, the world is going down fast, and you don't want to go down with it. I mean, there are other strategies. Be subversive. You know, once. Uh, um, the, the guy who coined the, the phrase, uh, I want my MTV, is a marketing wizard, and Fred Seibert, and he's one of my mentors. And, you know, when I went to the US, I used to wear Dolce and Gabbana shirts and yellow Versace pants and green uh, whatever shirts, you know. So I asked uh, Fred, I said, you know, Fred, how should I brand myself? You know, I'm new to this country. What's the, he said, you know what I did? He gave me his personal story. And he's like, you know, when I first joined the company, it was run by suits, and I was not a suit, but I started wearing suits. You know, I started camouflaging myself. My real intention was to create change and become a part of that environment where change can be made. It's also something that I've done in my own career. I had to work within a larger context, but keep pushing my own things that I thought were right Fortunately for me, the company agreed. We, we are a visionary brand, actually. The, eventually, there was an intersection on what I wanted to do and what they could do. But I think that these are choices that are very hard. We should, have, as parents, stop pushing our kids into doing the same thing that everyone is doing, just to make money. There's real good to be done in this world. By the way, and with technology and social media, you can do good and make money. That's the crazy thing. That's the thing that we, most people are not mining. You know, the fashion example I was giving you, research has it that if you're more diverse with your brand and you're more inclusive with your brand, actually it sells more product. But yet we are holding on to that we've inherited and we're conditioned. We're not questioning reality. Question it. I came specifically today because the topic kind of had a resonance with the last film that I made. It was an indo Park documentary made by like an Indian filmmaker and a Pakistani filmmaker and the theme was music and resistance 
and specifically the whole underground uh, music scene in Pakistan, which really speaks to the youth on both sides of uh, you know, the border. But what I want to ask you is, like through the whole journey of making the film, which took three years, uh, the initial pitch was that it's this um, dialogue, this narrative using this very angry sort of uh, saucy political satire that and videos and you know that that's a pitch that works to say like channels or commissioning editors because it's like like you said being irreverent subversive all of that but while making the film we realized that the more appealing narrative was a very nuanced narrative of four little girls who were coming from uh, uh, from a very violent a suburb of Karachi who were attending this music school. So the whole tone of the film then became very nuanced and subtle. And now that's not a pitch that's easy to sell. It's, you know, everyone wants uh, the, the, the sexy narrative or the... So how do you actually create, from your own personal experience, how do you create these spaces for more nuanced uh, narratives that actually like you said, makes the other more accessible. It's in the tone, it's in the texture, it's in the language. It's not a one-line pitch in that sense. So I'll give you an indirect response to that because it's such a wonderful question. Um, I think in schools now, they should teach how to handle rejection. You go to the best business school, the yeah. best whatever school in the world, and they actually don't teach you any strategies for real life. And this is something I've learned the hard way. Throughout my career, I have been rejected and rebuked. Not just rejected, rebuked. Punished for thinking differently. And I think our schools should teach people how to take punishment because the world is a brutal place. It's going to punish you, it's going to discredit your ideas, and it's going to keep telling you no, no, no. And for every time you, anyone says no to you, you have to get up and ask again. And that's the only thing I can suggest. Eventually, you'll find somebody who will say a yes. And all you need is out of, you know, on the law of averages, you need one yes out of every hundred. So there's so many things we have to change as a society. I mean, it sounds like a very big, heavy thing to say, but the truth is we need to. You know, we need to. We need to have our schools teaching people how to actually be change agents, even if they're bankers, you know? But we're not taught that. What we're taught is how to do the same thing we've done successfully better. And I think that's a load of crap. Coming from an MTV, and that too based in New York, I mean, I want you to know what made you take this path, which is completely different from what we see as MTV, um, you know, in terms of content. What motivated you to take such a strong voice? And it is so humbling to see this, because suddenly I'm going home very I don't know, just very humbled that there's so much to see and yet we haven't seen. I don't know much at all. You know, I truly don't. What I am though is I have a thick skin and I don't go away. It's hard. If I believe in something, I will stay like a worm, you know, a song in your head that keeps playing over and over again, till you, when it's not playing, you think of it, I'm like, shit, what happened to that song? And then you'll come and find me. So those are the only two things I can say. Look, I grew up on music. India is a crazy place that way. We are so many thousands of subcultures in this country, the richest civilization, I believe, in the world. And in my little world in Lucknow, I, grew, I went to Lamartineer, it's French, British, there you go. So we're both rock and roll to begin with. but. I was searching for this, this elusive thing that I could do in this world, you know. My parents wanted me, like everybody else, to be a doctor. Everyone in my family is a doctor. And I just stayed the path of, I didn't know then what I would be, but I didn't want to be a doctor. And I just followed the music, it's the truth. If there's any string of continuity in my own life, it's that I've always loved music. I didn't know how to play an instrument, I have a terrible voice, but I had to find the music, and it led me to MTV, and I stayed, and I didn't go away. Whether it was snowing or raining, I stood outside the fucking office and said, hire me, till they called. So. Hi. Um, 
So I have a content related question for you. Yeah. And I think because you've worked on so many diverse projects and in fact brought multiple cultures to New York and to America, what is your opinion on the kind of content channels like MTV are creating in India today? They've moved so far away from music or culture. <laughs> and what, what would be um, your advice to content creators today in our country, which is kind of polarized like America is, I think in a different way, yet it is. And they have audiences, captive audiences who are young, but no one is speaking to them you know, and, and telling stories that actually matter. They're kind of just propagating the same things over and over again. And I think while the theme may be love in most of the cases, it's kind of nuanced with a lot of hate. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird. What is that. nuanced with a lot of hate? The narratives. Which one? I think a lot of them on, on television today, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, on, on digital media it, today. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, one of the things I find very interesting in India is how smart people are, you know, truly. I'm not, I'm serious. Because I think we have some of the smartest people in the world and they understand shit. You know, they know, they talk about nuance, they talk about, I mean, my, I don't know if, like, I don't know if, I'm struggling like you are. Every day I want to do something that I feel that can make a difference and every day I'm told to do something else. And I've just given up on doing something else. I just want to do stuff that I want to do that I think, even it's, if it's just candy, if it's eye candy, useless, outrageous beauty, you know? Just beauty for the sake of it. And it doesn't answer your question, but I think w our time on Earth is so limited, you know? I think we need to deploy it usefully and forget about it. I think the people who win, like, in these creative fields are people who are just com completely blind to all this other it's noise, you know? They just power through. And you have to just power through. Forget about the legacy channels and the big, you know, big thing, the big platforms and brands that actually control the conversation. Guess what? My space went away. You know, a behemoth can fall just like this, you know? One day you're like everything, you control the conversation, the channels, the co content flowing through it. Next day, you're nothing, and someone else comes. You can be that next thing. You can be that next thing. So I would just say, stick with it. Be courageous, man. Take the chance. You'd rather be known for failing, trying to do the right thing, than be succeeding, doing the same thing everybody else did. Hi, Nusrat. Hey. Hi. Uh, you said that what you've done is just follow the music, but the talk you've given us um, right now is also, uh, it seems to me is also anchored in a very strong sense of humanity. And um, which I don't think, I don't know if just because you follow the music you have that sense of humanity, as in anyone. Mm. Um, and from all that you've been saying, I've been um, wondering if you've ever faced any crisis of faith um, and how you've dealt with that, because my sense today is that given the kinds of times we live in, that the crisis of faith is something a lot of us face. Uh, so you may begin by believing in humanity, but sometimes it erodes away. I have a crisis of faith every day. <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. Telling you the truth, we all do. Sometimes we don't have faith in our own parents or our own siblings and our friends. Sometimes in our presidency or in our, gov in our government and sometimes in just God, you know? Like, how could God let so many people die or, you know, people be killed by bombs and stuff like that? You know, you have to be local and tactical, I feel like, in these types of situations. I am nobody to talk about faith. I'm the biggest sinner that <laughs> ever was. I've done all kinds of crap, you know, and. So I cannot talk about faith. I can, however, talk about what I have done when I faced a lack, you know, a lack of faith, you know? So this year, you know, last year I went through a lot of disillusion because of the Syrian refugee crisis. It's not, somehow it impacted me deeply because I went and spent time there. And I was so depressed. And also, I mean, I know it sounds very childish to say this or whatever, but a lot of my idols were dying, you know? 
David Bowie died, you know, Muhammad Ali died, all sorts of people in my own family who were the elders and pillars of faith for me died. I didn't know what the hell to do. When David Bowie died, I was in Lucknow where I first actually listened to his music. And it sounds like a strange thing to say. I mean, here's somebody who has this faith in a singer that he's referencing instead of, you know, God or something. But music is God to me. And that's the closest I have had to heroes, the real heroes. And I was so depressed in Lucknow, I didn't know what the hell to do. So I decided that I would, I was in my new empty apartment, and I decided that I'm going to create a line of furniture in, as an homage to David Bowie. Again, when I brought this up, people said, what the fuck are you, I mean, you know, so they're used to stupid stuff from me, but, you know, they're like, what are you talking about? But I spent a lot of time, truly, creating Bowie-inspired furniture. I had no clue about carpentry, woodwork, or anything. And in Lucknow, everybody makes the same sofas, you know? There's no imagination. And so this was my protest against the darkness I was facing. And I teamed up with a Bihari carpenter who had never heard of David Bowie, no cared, to be honest. And I made a whole line of 15 pieces of David Bowie-themed furniture, from sofas to tables to carpets. And that process was so therapeutic to me because I created something real. It may have been shit, I didn't, it didn't matter. But the act of creation as, a, you know, as, as an homage to somebody I deeply cared for was very therapeutic to me. So I think a lot of times if you just take your lack of faith and your darkness and discouragement out of context, you, know, you can come back to that situation renewed when you actually go tangentially and do something else. I don't know if that answers your question, but that, that was my strategy. Every time I've been depressed or discouraged or rejected, which is a lot, by the way, I've gone to places where I can redeem myself by making something beautiful. Hi, just wanted to ask you one thing, that from unemployment to internship to employee and then now to this level, is there anywhere any in this your lifetime, uh, you came across a time either where you plateaued or there was a mistake done or an inspiring anecdote you can sum up for us? In 2007, something I, I can tell you many of such things because rejection is a second name for me, you know. Um, I think you should measure people and their success not by the you know, traditional measures of success, but how many times have they failed and gotten up again? Not taught in school. How to fail. And you have to be a great failure to be anything. I don't think of myself as successful at all. 2007, I faced that crisis. Some very important things I was uh, working on were all you know, nullified and shut down, and I had to let go of, I don't know, lots and lots of people. People I loved and I had trained. And it was devastating. It was probably the single, single most challenging professional thing I'd had to do. I could have died, you know? Died meaning gone away, or be a slug somewhere lying there. And I said, you know, f that, I'm gonna give myself another challenge, which is, like I was telling this lady, out of context, somewhere else. And I'd always been very interested in running the New York City Marathon, but never had gotten the time or, you know, could make the effort. And that, April, I decided I'd run the marathon. My foolish, childish thing, my hope was that if I complete it, I would be proving to myself that I can do more, I can rise, you know, I don't have to die. And I applied and they said, sorry man, it's all fulfilled, you know, you cannot run. I said, okay. Now it goes back to what I'm saying, I don't go away. I went back to them, I said, there's got to be a way for one more person to run the goddamn marathon. I can give you money. And they said, okay. <laughs> Why don't you run for a charity of your choosing? You have to raise a minimum of, I don't forget the number of dollars, $2,000 it was. And I said, yeah, of course I can do that. So I ran for a children's charity and I got in immediately. Not only did I get in, I was running, I was in the ce celebrity camp where people <laughs> like, you know, um, what's his name? Um, this is actor, his wife was running and all sorts of celebrities were there. And there I was, you know, and I trained for six or seven months like a dog. 
And in that training, I was born again. Not the actual day of marathon. When you're alone running on empty, icy bridges, you go beyond the physical challenges of it. You start rising, you know, and you go, and you're like a bird sometimes. You're watching your own body struggle with that. And that training enabled me to get over that crisis. And I went back to work, and I did other cool shit. But it was the challenge. And I made money, by the way. I, did, I threw a party with all my friends and said, come and like, you've got to give me 100 bucks. They all came and we made money for children and I ran the goddamn marathon. So I've had that crisis many times. And I haven't let it kill me yet. I'm going to rise. I don't go away. <laughs>